Welcome class. This Shakespeare lesson is going to be a literature focused video providing a walkthrough demonstrating how you could go about analysing a dramatic text. Today we're looking at the balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet, Act 2, Scene 2. And seeing as this is one of the most famous scenes in all of English literature, I'm not going to go through the entire scene. It's been done many times before, probably much better than I could do. Instead, I will be working my way through the scene, pointing out any interesting features I feel are worth focusing on. Now, many students struggle when annotating a text and they can end up highlighting absolutely everything and not really picking out too much substance. So, when annotating, I would ask yourself three questions. Are there any interesting language or structural devices that you can pick out? Does this significantly affect the audience and how? And does it reveal any essential qualities about the characters, the setting or the plot? So as I go along, I will aim to home in on the sections of the scene which offer the most interesting answers to these questions. So this scene immediately follows another one where Romeo's friends have lost him after he ran off after the party. Unable to find him amongst the dark trees, Benvolio admires Romeo's search for blind love, but Mercutio ominously responds by saying that if love be blind, love cannot hit the mark. Then we get Romeo alone at the base in the orchard of the Capulet Manor. And then as Juliet enters from the balcony, we get these immortal lines, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks. It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. One of the first things that we might notice here is the abundance of celestial or star-related imagery. Now, if you remember back to the prologue, and in several instances throughout the play, there are several mentions of Romeo and Juliet being called star-crossed lovers. The idea that they are fated and destined to be together and that their fate is sealed, set in the stars, inevitable. And Romeo comparing Juliet to the sun here unwittingly ties into that and the audience would get another sense um, that what is about to happen between these two is inevitably going to end in a tragic disaster. We also have an extended metaphor established here where Juliet is compared to the sun. Now, the sun has many associations with being benevolent and life-giving, but we get an interesting juxtaposition here because we also get the sense that Juliet as the sun is quite violent with the impulse to kill the envious moon, which might seem an apparent contradiction. But of course, this passage is full of juxtapositions, oxymorons and paradoxes. An interesting word to pick up on here is the word fair, which is repeated twice when referring to Juliet. The word has various meanings. Romeo could be saying that Juliet is righteous, just and fair in that sense of the word, but he could also be referring to her as white, bright and apparently pure. This could also be potentially a meta self-reference to the fact that all the women and girls on the Shakespearean stage would have been performed by young boys with faces caked in white makeup. Romeo also suggests that Juliet is fairer than the moon, and to understand this fully, it's important to know that in Roman mythology, the goddess of virginity, Diana, was often personified as the moon. This becomes significant in the lines that follow when Romeo says, Be not her maid, since she is envious. Her vestial livery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it. Cast it off. Romeo seems to be essentially telling Juliet under his breath that virginity is foolish and girls should not hold on to it. The audience might here remember that Romeo starts the play in a state of anguish because the girl that he had previously been chasing, Rosaline, who was herself compared to Diana in Act 1, Scene 1, has decided to join a nunnery and swear off sex forever. 
Perhaps a modern audience would view Romeo with a lot of suspicion, especially when we get an insight here into his thoughts that Juliet's virginity should be cast off when she is not even yet 14. To us, it casts a darker shadow over the whole scene, with us knowing that to some extent Romeo performs his elaborate praise and flirting to Juliet with the goal of taking her perceived Diana-like purity. Romeo continues the extended metaphor of comparing Juliet to cosmic orbs throughout this monologue, comparing her eyes to two of the fairest stars in all of heaven, and saying if they hung in heaven, the birds would still sing through the night, mistaking her bright gaze for daylight. The repetition here emphasises the idea that Romeo is blinded by love's bright shine. And the use of hyperbole regarding Juliet's otherworldly qualities uh, continues following her brief speech where she says, I me. After that, Romeo says, she speaks, oh speak again, bright angel, and compares her to a winged messenger of heaven. One of the most interesting things about all the comparisons Romeo makes is the fact that they are all things above him. Uh, he would stare up and look to the sky and see the stars, the sun and the angels. And it's significant in terms of the staging. And this is where Shakespeare is so ingenious in terms of the scene that he sets out, because throughout the whole of this, Juliet is physically above Romeo. So throughout the scene, literally and physically, she is above him seeming angelic throughout. Now, this is interesting when you consider the significance of names in the text. Shakespeare is very specific and particular with his choice of names. And as we see in the next few lines by Juliet, names essentially form the crucial conflict of the story, because if Romeo Montague was not called Romeo Montague, there would not be this conflict. Now, the word Romeo literally means a worshipper. It refers to a pilgrim who journeys to Holy Rome. But Romeo doesn't seem awfully religious himself. He is willing to seemingly abandon several Christian principles in order to be with Juliet. So the person, the thing that Romeo is actually worshipping is Juliet herself. He even calls her a dear saint later in the same scene. After Romeo has concluded his worshipping praise, Juliet, unaware of his presence, questions, O Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Now, first off, it's significant to say that the word wherefore here means why. Essentially, Juliet is bemoaning the fact that he is called Romeo and Montague and just saying, oh, why did it have to be so? We could have been together, but either he has to not be a Montague or I'll no longer be a Capulet. It's also significant in terms of the contrast between these two characters and their concerns at this point in the story. Obviously, Romeo's head is away in the clouds and he's concerned with the sky and the stars and angels and everything ethereal, but Juliet immediately is concerned with earthly, practical dilemmas. Then we see Juliet tussling with this emotional conflict within her. She says, what is in a name that which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet? So Romeo would were he not called Romeo. And essentially she's trying to justify it away in saying that Romeo is not the person he is because of his name. However, us as an audience, we know that names are actually quite significant in the story. You have a character called Benvolio, which literally means uh, goodwill or, you know, a well-intentioned person. And you have characters like Tybalt, which means Prince of Cats. It's assumed that he is an evil and malicious character. So in the same way that some things seem written in the stars and fated in this story, it seems that characters' fates and destinies are intimately tied 
to their names, especially seeing as their family names, whether they're Capula or Montague, essentially decides uh, their direction in life and their allegiances in the city of Verona. And the fact that Juliet tries to disregard all of that and reason that she can just throw it away just to be with the person that she fell in love with a few hours ago at a party seems to spell disaster and it would be incredibly ironic for the audience who would notice that. In response to this, Romeo, listening, jumps out of the bush and says, I take thee at thy word, call me but love, and I'll be new baptised. Henceforth, I never will be Romeo. Now, in a sense, this is quite revealing, and it shows that Romeo doesn't actually really understand Juliet. It seems as though he doesn't acknowledge that the true problem Juliet has is not with his first name Romeo, but with his surname Montague. Uh, the hyperbolic claim that he will be baptised with a different name also reminds the audience of the religious imagery that has been going on throughout this conversation. In a sense, Romeo is willing to throw away his Christianity and his Christian beliefs in favour of his new religion, the worship of Juliet. What follows is a kind of call and response between Juliet and Romeo, where Juliet offers practical reasons why their meeting is not suitable and why they can't really be together, while Romeo tries to justify these concerns away by saying, oh, it doesn't matter if they kill me because I would rather die than not see you. Oh, it doesn't matter that this wall is too high to climb because I am beswept by love and I can jump and leap any wall if it means that I can see my Juliet. At this point, the audience might be thinking that Romeo is extremely naive, or at least he's willing to say anything to get what he wants. However, Juliet seems to be the more rational voice, beginning this call and response by saying, my ears have not yet drunk a hundred words of thy tongue's uttering, reminding the audience that this it's ridiculous for them to be so deeply in love when, in fact, they have barely spoken. Following this exchange, Juliet has her own monologue where she debates whether to accept Romeo's pleas for affection and accept uh, truth in the words that he says about him loving her. And one thing that I think is important or significant to note during this speech is the light and dark imagery. Juliet seeming to equate light with truth and darkness with falsehood. She says, in truth, fair Montague, I am too fond, and therefore thou mayest think my behaviour light. Um, obviously punning on the term light there. Um, later on, she says, therefore pardon me, and do not impute this yielding to light love, which the dark night hath so discovered where she tries to essentially reassure Romeo that even though she is pronouncing her love in the darkness, that doesn't mean that it is any less true. Romeo then responds by saying, Lady, by yonder blessed moon, I vow. Basically him saying, look, if we're going to equate light with truth, then I'm going to swear on this extremely bright orb hanging in the sky. Juliet then responds, Oh, swear not by the moon, the inconsistent moon that monthly changes in her circled orb. Which, first of all, shows Juliet has some reluctance to truly accept Romeo and thinks that on some level this all might just be flattery. But it also ties in with the imagery Romeo presented earlier in the scene when Romeo establishes Juliet as in competition with the moon. Romeo then blusters about and Juliet responds, although I joy in thee, I have no joy of this contract tonight. It's almost like she's had enough and she's trying to shut down the conversation and say that it's all moving too fast. She says, it is too rash, too unadvised, too sudden, too like the lightning, which does cease to be Ear one can say it lightens. Sweet good night. This bud of love 
by summer's ripening breath may prove a beauteous flower when next we meet. She's comparing two different metaphors for love here. The first one is lightning, which is sudden, immensely powerful, destructive, but ultimately short-lived. Uh, and the other one is a ripening flower, uh, which requires patience and eventually blooms into something that lasts a lot longer. However, as the audience, this is an ironic comparison because we know that their relationship is going to be far more like lightning, far more destructive, short, and extremely sudden. And then Romeo seems to turn. He says, oh, wilt thou leave me so unsatisfied? Uh, now, many critics have viewed this differently. However, uh, I would suggest that unsatisfied probably has at least some sexual connotations. Romeo suggesting that Juliet is almost a little bit of a tease and that he deserves something more for all his efforts of trying to woo her. Juliet then replies, what satisfaction canst thou have tonight? And Romeo, changing tone, suggests that he would like to marry as quickly as possible. And bizarrely enough, it seems as though this pronouncement that he will give his faithful vow um, and the word of marriage finally changes Juliet's mind and Juliet agrees to marry him in the morning saying that my bounty is as boundless as the sea my love is deep the more I give to thee the more I have for both are infinite continuing the comparisons of love to vast natural forces Juliet is then interrupted by the nurse calling from within and what follows for the next few minutes is essentially the drawing out of the scene where Romeo will stay by the balcony and Juliet will go inside and come back out each time adding a bit more detail to their meeting. Juliet says what time shall we meet and Romeo says by the hour of nine. Juliet responds I will not fail to 20 years till then, suggesting that now that they are in love, any time spent apart is stretched to an unbearable length of time. Which finally links to Juliet's closing words of the scene before she finally goes inside. Before she leaves, Romeo says, I would I were thy bird, basically wishing that he could fly up, enter her room and become a pet. Juliet says, sweet, so would I, yet I should kill thee with much cherishing. Good night, good night, parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be morrow. Her showing that she is now deeply in the pangs of love and that if Romeo was a delicate bird in her hands, she was worried that she would hug it so hard that she would kill it. And finally, this brings back the conflict that we had at the start of the scene where even though Romeo is suggesting that Juliet is a wonderful beautiful son there's still some kind of violent tension there that she could kill the moon and here you have her saying that she's worried that she could accidentally kill him ironically foreshadowing the tragic ending so having gone through the scene how do we put all this together into an analysis paragraph? Well, here's a waggle, what a good one looks like. Throughout the scene, Juliet shows the audience that she is wrestling with several internal conflicts, as shown throughout her opening monologue and the call and response dialogue with Romeo. She is conflicted as to whether she should favour family or freedom. She doesn't know whether she should trust a man who she has only just met that evening or not. Essentially, she is torn between following her heart or her head. Despite her finally deciding to agree to secretly marry Romeo by the end of the scene, her final line, parting is such sweet sorrow, that I shall say good night till it be morrow, reveals that she is emotionally torn still. The oxymoron sweet sorrow highlights how Juliet sees the situation as simultaneously unbearable and joyful. She could say goodnight for so long that the day would turn into morning. 
She wants to leave him immediately and never wants him to leave at the same time. She adds, I should kill thee with much cherishing, meaning she could love him to death, showing the extremes of emotion the character feels and ironically foreshadowing the tragic ending. As you can see, you don't need to cling on to a paragraph structure, whether you're relying on PEE -E or Petal or Peter or Pecuie or whatever mess of letters is in fashion with teachers at the time. As long as you are making relevant points, providing evidence that it is true, using accurate terminology and explaining the effect on the reader or audience, you can construct your paragraph in whichever way feels natural to you. Thank you for listening. I hope this has been helpful. This was a slightly longer video than I was planning to make. But if these are useful, please let me know because I will continue to make them. Again, I hope that everybody is staying safe and I hope to see you all again as soon as it is safe to do so. I'm going to add some extra resources down in the description box and also some links to various other sites that you can go to for more information. Uh, please like, click subscribe so that you get notifications when I do more of these videos. Share it with anyone that you think this might be useful for and take care.